high resolution uh, structure of um, a modeling of the HIV spike protein tomorrow, and that's at midday downstairs in 2036 in our Tools and Tech seminar series. So, Chandra, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the for the um, invite and for that um, flattering introduction. It shows my age. You know. We accumulate this as the integral of uh, little bits of effort all, all along the way. But um, structural biology has definitely become a, a, it started off as an avocation and now it's become a full-fledged area uh, of uh, research, uh, especially bioinformatics. Uh, but this talk that I'm going to give to you is, um, is you know, couched in some computer science, some mathematics, because that's what I know. Uh, and of course, it's tuned to this application of prediction. And part of the message is also a framework that I've been developing this last year with my PhD student, Mohibur Rashid, uh, following on the footsteps of lots of other people who've been working in similar areas. And that's on providing you know, proof certificates for your pr prediction, something we call quantified uncertainty. So the problem itself is uh, perhaps explanatory by these two pictures that I've drawn here. This is, if you're given a, a bunch of uh, flexible tiles, you can think of them as molecules. Can you predict this multi-molecular assembly? Uh, so uh, as I'll show you pretty soon, it could be akin to uh, to putting 3D jigsaw puzzles together. Um, and the other problem is, uh, in some sense, a special case. And that is, you're given a single tile, but you are given unlimited copies of it. Can you predict if it can close up to form spherical shells? And spherical shells of just different sizes. And can you predict what are the other sizes meeting a certain kind of a you know, a stability function or a scoring function of, of a proper assembly. Um, but like all work, you know, one always rests on, this, on, the, on the shoulders of giants. Uh, so I like to acknowledge people uh, beforehand. So biology uh, and math are kind of intertwined. And, and many of the names that you see here are senior people who I've interacted with over time. Um, and I owe them a lot of thanks because, uh, because you know, they've been nice with their time to first humor you into um, in trying to understand what are the basic principles uh, of their science and uh, also willing to learn as to what our science is. So some people that you see here is just a recent uh, math PhD student of mine, Andrew Gillette now, he moved to Arizona. So he, and so is Goliang Xu, now he's in Beijing. Uh, and Rizal Chowdhury is another student who, who uh, is a sunny study book. Uh, so this is a mix of past students as well as uh, lots of senior investigators I've met over time. Uh, and today's work, I guess, impinges a lot on uh, stuff I used to do with Art Olson at ESRI, also uh, Andy McCammon and a little bit with Michael Holtz. And tomorrow's talk, I'll tell you a little bit of what I used to do with Wachu and Steve Lutke and Tim Baker, and also more recently with Manfred Auer. Um, this is the current snapshot of people in my lab. As you can see, it's all these fluxes and you know, uh, uh, wanes. But the students I've had are from computer science, sometimes from mechanical engineering or chemical engineering or from mathematics. So what's the problem I'm, uh, oh, actually, I could use this. I'm saying, well, let's draw the analogy first to 2D jigsaw puzzles. And you're given a bunch of pieces. Can you go back and fill a hole? And in this classic version, you know, the final picture with no gaps in it is kind of a visible proof that you've got the thing right. Uh, if you have any piece out of place, you can also notice it. And you can you know, locally or globally score it. Same thing is for, you know, oops, I should know where to point. Uh, yeah. So is for 3D jigsaw puzzles. 
So you can go back and assemble if you have a artifact, you know, uh, architectural piece, and that gets broken up, and you have all the pieces, and can you put it back together? And suppose you don't have some piece, that problem can also be counted as well. So at least get some kind of a scoring function that tells you that the pieces that you have are glued in the right combination and, and put back together. And a different version of this problem is, in building 3D navigational um, maps or layouts that uh, we are all now getting familiar with, with with our mobile phones. But you can go back and put buildings together or artifacts together by taking point cloud scans or laser scans or LIDAR scans. And then it's a question of fusing them all together to build up a three-dimensional multi-view reconstruction. So, all of these problems are reducible to the problem that I'll be posing. Um, the, the special case, of course, or the cases that are for structural bioinformatics are if these are proteins or maybe even a combination of proteins and nucleic acids, can you go back and predict the multi-molecular assembly or macromolecular assembly? And also, if you're given multiple copies, can you go back and predict how these assemble together with some kind of a global symmetry that is requisite in most spherical tilings? So with that background, let me jump right in and, and try to formalize this problem in a common statement. Uh, and that is, suppose you're given, say, n components. And these components are flexible. Uh, of course, the rigid case is a special case, but they have some order of flexibility. What is the problem? Then the problem is to really come up with these set of transformations that you can apply to each component, such that you can go back and transform them and map them into this complex. So this is like taking each component and mapping it under its range of rigid body and flexible transformation. And so this complex is the assembly problem. But what we have to do is, since it's a model, we have to come up with a scoring function. How do we score what this complex is? What is truth? And so we have to also come up with a plausible and well-defined scoring function. And once we have that, then the problem becomes compute the set of transformations such that the corresponding complex maximizes the scoring function. And the scoring function is monotonic in the sense that if you have some missing pieces, the scoring function will only improve if you put all the missing pieces in there. So when you get the final complex, the score of the final complex should be much higher than if you had some pieces which were missing. And since most scoring functions are going to be highly non-convex, and every time you're Casting a problem into it as an optimization problem, you don't want to report just a single answer. What we'll do is come up with a distribution of answers. And this is what we'll call, we want to come up with k such solutions ranked by their scores. And additionally, by something I, I've introduced called uncertainties. And in general, if you were just to think of this, the spurt space is clearly exponential. I mean, they, you've got all of these you know, components, and each one of them has some order of transformation. So if L is the average number of internal degrees of freedom for each component, it can have the L choices of each component, each confirmation. Then this is really an NL space. So you can see that this thing goes very, very fast. Is, and hence, it becomes a combinatorial nightmare. Um, what about the two-body problem? And this two-body problem is you know, well known in, in structural bioinformatics, and that's coming up with what we call the molecular docking problem. So if I give you two molecules, saying, can you go back and search for the best relative transformation and relative conformation that yields a complex with the minimum binding free energy? So your, your scoring function is also an optimization of coming up with something we call the relative binding energy or the, or the relative free energy of this molecule. And what this is, is roughly described here. But I'll, I'll come back and give you more details about it. But this 
delta E, or sometimes used as delta G, is the scoring function for the complex minus the scoring function of each of the individual components. And if this difference is, in some sense, as negative as possible, then these two molecules are better off being in close proximity and also docked with each other. And so they have higher binding affinity because they can minimize their free energy by coming together rather than being isolated. And so this is then a plausible scoring function, at least in the case of molecular components. In the case of rigid bodies or other kinds of applications, you have to come up with similar scoring functions. And I won't go into that much detail because I only have an hour today. So we worked on this problem actually several years ago. And, and here was a way we mathematized the problem and also came up with a solution. And today's talk will build upon this. So it's good to a little bit understand the details behind these. So what we did was we built a scoring function which is somewhat asymmetric. And so very soon you'll understand why that's a, it's an asymmetric scoring function. So we took our molecule A and we thought of a grown layer. We call it the skin of the molecule. Well, that molecule A was a collection of atoms with their covalent bonded structures. And this molecule B, we took the first layer of solvent exposed atoms and we called it that as the skin. And so we said that if these two molecules have to come as close together as possible in a dark position and for a biophysical term called the van der Waal energy, that's what you would like to have, then the best overlap would be that the skin of this and the skin of this dock together. Very similar to what people often refer to, molecules come together as a lock and key. And we would like to penalize if they would sterically interfere with each other, because the electron density of this and the electron density of this repel each other. So hence, we don't want any skin core clashes or core core clashes. So one way to do this and set it up as a scoring function was to think of a complex function defined on these skin and core. So if you take a real value and associate it with a skin, and you take a complex valued function and associate it with a core, the pink, then real real product would be real. Real complex would be complex. And complex complex would be a negative real. So you can then integrate over this product and set up your scoring function to be this complex valued affinity function producted with the complex valued affinity function over the space of transformations, relative transformations of molecule B with respect to molecule A. So, and you're summing this up over the entire domain of skin, 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 core overlap. And so this itself is nice for two reasons. A, you've been able to capture exactly what is the configuration you want. But B, you can search over this for all possible relative transformations. And if you look at this function, it looks very much like a convolution function. It's a convolution, though, not over the spatial variables, but over the transformation space. So we call this convolutions over motion space or transformation space. But that Having done that gives you the idea that, oh, I can speed this up because convolution can be done very fast using fast Fourier transform. And that's the thing we exploit. So we're going to go back and go back and compute this optimization function by sampling the entire space of transformation because we don't know where the solution is. We can bias the sampling sum saying, clearly, don't sample in the middle of this molecule if you're moving this molecule around. So we sample in some region, like a narrow band around this molecule. So that kind of banding and adaptation can be done. But within that, we don't know the exact configuration that would maximize this function. But we're going to use the fast Fourier transform. Oops. This scoring function, what we choose is actually a biophysical and also a little bit of a knowledge base potential. Biophysical is 
is called in the biophysics literature as an mm solvation energy. So the mm is the energy of the molecule in its bonded structure, the internal energy. This is the fact that the molecules are all in solvent, which is predominantly water with some salts, you know, ionized as potassium, sodium, and chlorine, and so on. So positive and negative ions. So this is the energy internally of the molecule, this is the energy of interaction of the molecule with the solvent, and this is the thermodynamical term where T is the temperature and S is the entropy. And the fact that these terms can be then further parameterized in terms of the internal energy is the fact that things are bonded, so there's bond stretching, there's a certain dihedral angle uh, energy, there's also something with the torsion about a bond. And so these terms are expressed as the bonded terms. And then there's the fact that molecules, when they are bonded together, develop a partial charge distribution. They can be both a electrostatic and a van der Waal interaction. Already an atom consists of an electronic cloud centered around a nucleus which is positively charged. So a neutral atom, same amount of electron charge around it protons inside the nucleus. But the protons of one can attract the electrons of the other. Positive attracts negative, but not too close. If they get too close, then the electronic clouds will interact. So this is often expressed in this parameterized function called the van der Waal energy, which is that you get a net attraction of 1 over r to the 6 of the positive attracting the negative, but then you get a repulsion which if they come too close. So two atoms can come very close, but not too close. When they start interfering with the other, this energy will go off to positive infinity. And of course, these exponents, you know, are empirical. That's why this is often called an empirical scoring function. You can have different types of coefficients to balance out. And these coefficients above here are depending on the atomic types. For biomaterials, these are often carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and, and uh, hydrogen, maybe some sulfur. But there's the Coulombic term called the electrostatic term, which is also to be calculated. So what's unique about the mechanical energy is that this is automatically a, a pairwise summation that has to be estimated, and that's quadratic time. And if you're going to score this for every confirmation, this is part of the inner loop of your calculation. And so quadratic time for most average proteins is prohibitive. And so what you want to do is start to make that as fast as possible. So a lot of research went in early on in the computational biophysics literature and uh, algorithms were to make this linear time calculations. Because these are configuration dependent. These Rij's are the distance between the atoms. So every time the atoms configurations, relative configurations change, you have to recalculate this energy. To make matters worse, the solvation term is, oops, I didn't press that, but it moved. Okay. To make, is, this solvation term is the interaction with water, and that's equally important, about, you know, roughly 50% uh, of the total energy. Uh, and they involve terms, some of them easy to compute, but these last two terms, the dispersion energy and the polarization energy, have various theories and models of computing them. One of them is requiring you to solve the Poisson-Boltzmann equation, which is saying the total potential is equal to the charge density. These are the fixed charges and these are the mobile charges, which are caused by the salt ions around it, and they are in a Boltzmann-like distribution. And solving this equation, which has a varying dielectric, which is given by epsilon r, is fairly complicated. It's not a what's called an elliptic PD. It's a somewhat of a, with this varying dielectric, a nonlinear effect. So solving this Poisson-Boltzmann becomes a thing that lots of people worked on, and so did we. And what you're seeing here is for this binding for a Machupo virus, binding affinity, the blue is negative and the red is positive, or the other way around. Uh, but it's showing you the electrostatic potential, which is far-reaching potential. This is why molecules, when they interact, it's like, you know, a potential pull that causes them to come into
to close encounters and, and so the far reaching effects are as equally important. An alternative to this is a summation formula called the Born Energy Calculation. And today's technology is that roughly you can do this much, much faster in linear time. You can also solve this in, in somewhat linear time. The constant in front of this is much larger than the constant in front of this. So most of the time we prefer to use generalized Born if you want very large estimations. But if you want more accurate binding affinity estimations, then you go and switch to Poisson. And this is not the ultimate. If you want to do even more accurate, then you have to do some quantum interactions as well. So these are empirical models, but they're good enough for the case of Docker. What's the other problem? Besides the scoring, is this huge combinatorial search. And the reason why we are interested in this is again, we are doing science. And most of computer science or informatics deals with search and scoring. And so this is what attracted us to this problem originally and also for this assembly problem. So what is the search space between two rigid objects? Well, one way you can think of it is you can parameterize it by six dimensions, three rotations and three translations. So you keep this molecule fixed and you rotate this oriented relative to this in three degrees and you can translate this relatively in x, y, z. But there are other parameterizations of this. And as I'll show you just in a second, uh, a different parameterization is actually better off for fast Fourier transform. And this is thinking of the six dimensions can be reparameterized by saying you can orient this molecule in three orientation directions. That's given by the special orthogonal group called SO3 for rotation. You can orient this also in three. But one degree of orientation or rotation of this molecule is dependent on the rotation here, exactly the rotation about the line joining the centroid. So this has only two independent degrees of freedom. And the last is the distance between them. That's the translational degree. So this six-dimensional rigid body transformation is five rotations and one translation. Why am I getting into a little bit of the detail? Because there are two things that we are always interested in. A, accuracy of our prediction, and then after that, we are interested in the speed of our calculation. And this really, this choice impacts the speed. The accuracy comes from how well do we sample and how well do we score, uh, which captures the other. Another important problem that we have to take into account is not, molecules are not rigid, and so we have to identify what are the rigid domains and what are the connections between them. And this by itself, this flexibility model, is a huge prediction model. So we make some approximations here, which I'll tell you about. But given all of that, suppose it had some L degrees of freedom, then the total space for flexible docking for just a pair becomes 3L plus 6. Hence, for N molecules, it becomes N times 3L plus 6. So it goes very fast. However, when you have symmetries of your overall structure, then this can be reduced. And I'll show you how that occurs. So part of what I, you know, and a nice discussion early on with both Barry and, and uh, Yang Zhang was how do you go back and take a structure and find out which parts are rigid relative to each other, which group of atoms are rigid and which are, are not. And there are many methods out there. What we've adopted is something somewhat like a hierarchical partitioning uh, approach based on simple normal mode analysis. But it's hierarchical in that we don't group these atoms at a per atom basis. We can group them into secondary structure and tertiary structure. The bottom line is that you can identify these rigid domains, those where the group of atoms are moving all with somewhat the same mean motion and having very small variance in their motion under a certain model of energetics. And once you identify these domains, you then have to worry about what is the parameterization of the overall molecule is what is the interdomain motion. And we cast that as a motion graph. And based on the connections between these rigid domains, 
There can be multiple linkers as well as flexible loops, which are like self loops, and other kinds of leading domains, which are hinge based or shear based. One comes up with a motion parameterization saying this has that many translational degrees of freedom and that many rotational degrees. So those are the L degrees of freedom that I was talking about when we're talking about flexible. So for example, for this molecule, these are the primal in some sense parameters that we make this or this is the flexibility model we've chosen for this tile. Now this might not be accurate, but it's with this model that we are building up and there's some uncertainty that will be attached to this model. One can improve this by doing some reachability analysis saying I have this structure in two different conformations. With this model can I go from this structure under this parameterization to this other structure and minimize the distance. Then he's saying you've got some confidence that these two models are, this flexibility model is reasonable. But you can also be, you know, more conservative and have fewer degrees of freedom, or you can be more liberal and have many more degrees of freedom. But if you want to go down to the atomistic level, then the total number of degrees of freedom would be some roughly three times the number of atoms that becomes prohibitively large, so you're always looking for a reduced space in which you want to search. The next little notion I want to tell you about is what we call low discrepancy sampling of motion. Since we're going to do this comp you know, uh, computation, to go back and do it, we want to do it on the computer, we do it with discrete fast Fourier transform. So every motion, even though it's a continuous variable, we want to discretize. How do we choose what are the discrete spacings between them? Now, translation spaces are easy to do. You can come up with uniform spacings in Cartesian grids, and this will have what we call low discrepancy, which I'll define to you in a second. But this was a nice challenge problem also in Hilbert's list of problems. How do you take orientation space, which is a special orthogonal group, which is like akin to the solid sphere? How do you distribute points on the solid sphere such that the distance between any two points, or if you take the distribution of distances between all neighbors, they are all equal? It's called uniform sampling of the solid sphere. And coming up with different schemes to doing that, if you did the simple naive Euler angle, which are the three Euler angles, which are the rotation about the x, y, and z axis, and sample them uniformly, you would get what I call biased distributions. They're not what I call low discrepancy. But other non-uniform adaptive samplings will give you better distribution. The good news is you don't have to rely on randomization. You can actually come up with deterministic methods of uniform distribution. These are called Hammersley and Sobel sequences. So what is discrepancy? It's saying that I get some measure of uniformity. And how do I measure this uniformity? Saying, let me take any subset in my space, and my overall space is, you know, some x, and my little subset is r. The number of points that lie inside r divided by the total number of points should roughly be equal to the ratio of the volumes of the subspace. So the measure on r is like the, in two dimensions would be the area, in three dimensions the volume, and so on. So if I count the number of points that lie inside R divided by the total number of points, then this difference from the ratio of the volume should be small. If it's zero, then you've got perfect you know, uniformity. But this should be true for any subset of R in a certain family of subsets. So if I took all boxes, small and big, but they were all parallel or isothetic, so in this family of R, I would find to find the ones which are the, the difference between these this ratio. And if I can show that this total value, the soup, is small, very small, then I said I've got a uniform sampling of that. So the other good news is it's a good measure, but it's also that you can do this not by randomly, but by fixed deterministic sequences. And this is what has been the advent of what is known as quasi Monte Carlo sampling. So there's a fixed sequence, and I don't have time to tell you about Alton and Hammersley points, but you can already see if I take 
points generated randomly as you do in Monte Carlo sampling from some pseudo random generator, then you get a certain nice distribution of points, but I can give you a deterministic sequence where the discrepancy is really very low. You can see all of these Voronoi tiles. For those who don't know Voronoi, Voronoi tessellations are you decompose given this set of points into cells such that every cell surrounding a point, these points are closest to this point than to any other point. So the, the cells are all partitioned by their bisectors between neighbors. So such you know, grouping and taking Hammersley points are low discrepancy points. The reason we want these is they have bounded distances between them. They are close to uniformity. And we need these low discrepancy bounds to produce what I call uncertainty bounds in our prediction. Okay. Now, how do I sample? If I take most number of samples, then my error should go down. And But if I take more number of samples, I should have them with low discrepancy. Just increasing the number of samples is not going to do the trick, because you could all be clustered in a certain corner. But you want low discrepancy bounded large number of course, your errors will go down provably, and that's what we So then we come down to this fast rigid body, and I'll, I'll go a little faster because I think uh, for those who clued on, um, but this is the detail in the in the in the uh, speed up. Um, but like I said, accuracy is more important than speed up. But speed up is also essential. Is when I'm computing this, if I compute this convolution naively over the motion space then if I have a description for A and a description for B, and I sample this with M samples, M cube samples, and M cube samples, I'll get something like you know, um, M to the sixth in my computation. But if I can do things faster using more refined computational math and saying, oh, suppose I did part of this convolution as a, as a Fourier sum. So then I can go and transform this into Fourier space, product or convolution in primal space is producted Fourier space. So I can once and for all convert this into the Fourier transform of A and Fourier transform of B, compute the product and map it back. The problem with this is that I can either do the convolution over translation space if I use Cartesian because they are invariant under translation. But then I can't do rotations. So I get a speed up of only part of it. I get a speed up of m cubed, but not for the rotations. I have to do each rotation and call a 3D FFT for the translation. So the next idea was, what if I grouped all my parameters into the same space? So if I have five dimensional rotations, then I can do five dimensional Fourier transforms. And hence, I can get speed up in five dimensions. And the answer is yes. But the details are how do you choose the right basis? If you use spherical harmonics, they are only a two dimensional basis. So you have to do a three dimensional Lagrange basis, multiply them, show them that these are invariant. And this is something where we want rotational invariance. These are called Wigner functions. Again, I'm not trying to impress you by just flashing these things there. I'm saying there's a little bit of math to improve the efficiency. Most of it has been worked out. How do you apply it to your domain problem was the kind of computational exercises that we had to do, everything with a bounded discrepancy. And so the overall complexity, in the worst case, even though it might look like m to the 6, is far less than the product of a product of b times m to the 6. They're doing many things very fast. And this becomes the bane of a lot of frameworks. Every time you're doing geometric optimization of nonlinear convex, non-convex functions, you know that to find the global minimum is very hard, but you can apply fast Fourier analysis to exhaustively search in certain reasons. And this is what has been the bane of a lot of my techniques and the software that we develop. One other thing is remember that I showed you the scoring function that we had used had many terms. And I would have to compute each of these terms. How do I, not all of these terms are, by the way, 
independent. How do I add them together? And so any scoring function, you know, one has to also go through the exercise. You don't want to go trial and error. So whenever you have a multi-term scoring function, which has something based on Van der Waals, something based on electrostatics, you want to come up with a weighted sum as your scoring function, then one can use a machine learning method to go back and set these weights. This machine learning method says, suppose I give you a training set which has both correct confirmations and also a set of decoys. Then I can reduce this choice of the optimal weights as an optimization quadratic program. So I can minimize this two norm on the weights with some regularization where all my weights are shifted away correctly with respect to the error. So choice of weights to partition scores are very important because they calibrate your scoring functions in various types of conditions. And this is what we have to do for our, for our docking. So, so far, what I've told you is only the two body docking, but I'll quickly lift this into the combinatorial and show you what the insights are for the other. So what, what you're seeing in this very busy chart is, you know, the fact that each of these terms does make a difference. This was the, the electrostatics and the uh, the Boltzmann interaction. The takeaway from that little video was positive and negative cancel each other, and hence you know, maximize or minimize the delta E. Um, and so this is, you know, the reason that positive attracts negative, and so if, if there's complementarity in the potential. That's very good for the binding. But it's also evident by this little chart here, which is color coded and maybe difficult to see uh, back there. So I'll just read out a few of this term. This is on some benchmark. There are certain benchmarks in the, in the community. And we looked at several of them. And in the papers that I'm mentioning here are many more benchmarks and tests and comparisons with other people. Um, but the bars are representing how many predictions did we get, which were very close to the true solution. So in some of the exercises, you know the molecule A and B, and also you know them in a complex form. And so you start out with A and B, you predict the solution, and then you compare it with the true result under these benchmarks. And by doing this, what we found that as we added various terms, and just code them based on just the Van der Waal or just the electrostatics or the hydrogen bonding or the interface propensity, that we kept improving our predictability. And this predictability improves up to a certain limit where it starts to plateau. Why? Because these terms are not all independent and the choice of weight influences something, but also some terms are not present, like the entropy. So in our binding affinity, we have not estimated the relative entropy. So there's still much more to be done, and but at least you're getting to a pretty high level of predictability. But doing these benchmarks was not satisfactory. So one of the things that I started to work on this last year is saying, you know, we do a lot of validation of our model. We also do lots of verification of the accuracy of the model, the process of validation and verification in most predictions. We should start doing a lot of uncertainty quantification because it relates both to the validation and the verification. So what is uncertainty quantification? It's like saying, can I take the uncertainties which are known or unknown for measurable quantities in the physical process of how the input data was created and propagate that to building a certain bound on the uncertainty of our result? So for example, in the molecules, when I was looking at these functions, I now have functions which have some bounded uncertainties propagated from the uncertainties in the input. So the input was PDB structures. They have not only their positions, but they also have a certain thing called the temperature factor. The larger the temperature factor, the more uncertainty there is in the, in the diffraction analysis for the position of each atom. So we want to take these uncertainties in the input and propagate them to the uncertainties of our function. 
then look at the process of our integration and bound the uncertainty in our in our calculation. So both numerical and 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 uh, I mean the verification and validation should be qualified with an uncertainty variance bound. And this is not new. This is what people in statistics have been doing for a long time. They've been looking at the likelihood of a value that they achieve, or they're looking at confidence intervals. They also measure what's called the standard error of their sampling. But what we in computer science, at least, and some others have started to do are prove what are called Chernoff bound. This is a certificate that the overall mathematical and computational model which guarantees that the probability that I have of my solution from the true solution is bounded. Bounded for a certain distance threshold t. What that means is that my prediction, if, I, if you give me a value of t, then I will also compute the probability of how good is my probability with respect to this epsilon or vice versa. You give me an epsilon of confidence that you want. You said, give this to me with 90% probability. Then I will tell you what t does my process go back in. So I'll prove this Chernoff bound, which is something that I would like to attach to my prediction. And such uncertainty quantifications or certificates, I think, is essential for both our calibration of have we achieved the best we can or can we do better? And it's also a way to compare between one method and another. So there are various ways to compute these turn off bounds. And one simple way that we've adopted is known by is, is an ideas of, of McDiarmid is the method of bounded differences or concentration. It's saying, go back and compute this uncertain or turn off bound by going back and computing the maximum deviation in each of the variables and then summing it up. So you compute the maximum variance with respect to, first you think of all of your input variables to be random variables. But when you compute these CKs, you can fix all the others and just look at the variance with respect to XK. And if you can compute them for each one of the variables, one at a time, then the univariate variances can be lifted to a multivariate variance bound by this expression sum of the CK squareds over the 2T squared. You can see that the greater the distance, the, you know, the uh, higher the probability of your, of your uh, prediction. But the tighter you want to make your predictions from the true result, the smaller the probability based on these variances individually weighted by these CKs. And it's computing these CKs is where there's low discrepancy sampling plays the major role. If you have bounded discrepancy or quasi Monte Carlo sampling, then I can determine these CKs very efficiently for all of the docking projects. So with that, we have spent a lot of time in explaining, you know, where the two-body docking problem, which is the, now the foundations, let me quickly jump and tell you about the n-body problem and also the symmetric assembly problem. So what was the Remaining tasks to be done. I say it's now reduced to a combinatorial search. So suppose you're given this set of components, which was my original puzzle pieces. I'm trying to predict this those puzzle. And I already have a ability of quantifying, you know, what are the pairwise interactions between every pair of puzzles that I have now developed a certainty quantified pairwise docking. So I can put all of this into an assembly graph. So I compute a graph. Each component is a vertex. And each edge are, is giving you a confirmation, a transformation, and a score with a certain uncertainty. And multiple edges between every pair is saying there are many choices of different confirmations, which are all very high and with low uncertainty high scores with low uncertainty. Just because the pairwise docking problem is also non-convex, so I can't give you a unique answer. So I'm going to choose over various confirmations. This is important, as you'll see in a minute. If you were to take the best configuration between A and B and the best configuration between A and C, you might not get the right answer. 
So what you have to do is search over plausible high ranking scores to search for the rest of the combinatorial mix. So this is what I'm showing you in this little piece, and then I can go back and explain this. The best configuration between A and C is 12, and I'm taking a single number for this example, and this is also 12 for this configuration. There's another configuration is also at 12. So when I put these two together, I choose these two reds, I get this configuration, which is not anywhere close to 12. So what is a puzzle problem reduced to? It says once you have this multigraph, any choice of a spanning tree is a solution. Because once I fix the configuration between A and C and B and C, I fix the configuration between all them. If you have n, you have to choose n minus 1 edges, such a graph or a tree is called a spanning tree. Only one edge between every pair, and you have to have the entire set of vertices connected. That's called the spanning tree. So the problem statement reduces to given an assembly graph computed by a pairwise docking, a multigraph with all your you know, scores and UQs, find a spanning tree such that the global score for the assembly is maximized. And while this might sound easy, the problem is that the number of spanning trees is huge, it's exponential. And it's exponential, so if you're going to search, you're going to have an exponential time algorithm, and this is already can be guaranteed. Because even simpler versions of this, in particular the monkey puzzle, is in two days, is NP hard. Which means there's no, no known provable polynomial time algorithm for it. What is this monkey puzzle? Suppose you're given you know, this three by three arrangement with little pictures of monkeys. You can think of this as a molecule with some attribute functions on them. And you want to build this entire complex such that all of the pictures are What one can show is that this monkey puzzle problem reduces to our combinatorial assembly problem, and hence this problem being NP hard, combinatorial NP, uh, combinatorial assembly is also NP hard. But we don't stop there. What we do is we search for what are called polynomial time approximation schemes. And the bad news is that even polynomial time approximation schemes for or multigraphs is hard. There's no known solution. And greedy solutions are, they don't work very well. They can't guarantee you bounds on their predictability. So to show you two methods that people have looked at in the past, one method is that of Inbar, Benjamin, Nusenov, and Wolfson back in 2005 saying, let's do the greedy search see what kind of solutions we get, they said, we'll take a fixed number of solutions, let's say some D, and we'll grow these clusters incrementally. So I start off with individual components for my puzzle, A, B, and C. Here A is, say, 3. Uh, but I'm going to keep intermediate clusters up to 5. So each time I take the, the best configurations, and since B and C had some pairwise docking, there were two of them. They will form a group. And if I continue on, I go back and get these solutions. So at the end, I've built a spanning tree. And the best ranked solution I got was this. Notice here what happens is that you have taken the best ranked solution with each step and not search for suboptimal solution. Because the problem is NP hard, you can't just take the greedy approach the approach will not work, but that's what they were doing. Another Huang's method is very similar. I'm going to skip it here for time and move on and tell you why this approach was not correct. And that is here. If you look at this configuration, this configuration in between A and B was a suboptimal configuration. It had a score of only 8. And this total sum sums up to the, to the maximum score. And this was the solution of the puzzle. Of course, I built this example to show you why the greedy approach doesn't work. But of course, this example could occur in general in, in, in multi-approach complex. 
So, what we developed then was a algorithm which has three major parts. We first did some discrepancy candidate solutions to go back and solve the pairwise docking to give you the valid pairwise solutions of high scores and, and low uncertainties. We learned our scoring terms both for the use Z scores that Yang had also worked on and, and developed and also this un uncertainty quantification. We looked at each of the scores and we scored the subtrees with domains and edges. And furthermore, and most importantly, we were widened our search space to assume suboptimal solutions were built in as, as they came along. So with this, we went and implemented this and provided on a few set of examples. And right now, this is something that we are constantly improving, but I'll just quickly walk you through one such example. So this is the case of a uh, this was actually a complex, I think, that was posed in one of the capital challenges a couple of years ago. That's what prompted our, our also my interest in trying to work off an uh, automated solution. This is to go back and build these clusters or grow these spanning trees with various weighted clusters where our weights are not only on each um, node, but also we take various combinations and complete these clusters by taking some suboptimal and some optimal configurations. The final goal is these all subtree generated are not shown in this example because I'm generating a few more subtrees by increasing my search space. But finally, we get to a solution where, with bounded uncertainty, it comes pretty close to the predicted solution. So in this case, everything works very well, and it works well, you know, with what we call the total RMSD calculation with something like 2.33 from the known predicted solution. Is the problem completely solved? The answer is no, because what we have done is still a what's called a prune and search method. We've increased our search space, but we are still doing all kinds of exhaustive searching of various subtrees so that we can percolate our subtrees as we grow them such that we are keeping the maximal solution in there. But, you know, what's the guarantee? So the guarantees that we are trying to prove now is this uncertainty propagation in our step. Think, what sampling of subtrees is sufficient such that you give me an error, and I'll say, OK, I can give you a turn off bound with that error. So that's the next step in this, in this puzzle. But before we solve that, I wanted to quickly tell you about a solution where we can come up with a guarantee already for a special case. And this special case is the case of when you have symmetries in your puzzle. So symmetries help, it reduces the search space. And finite thing is if you're fixing exactly what type of symmetries they are existing for your shapes, then you can quickly go back and prove or derive these turn off bounds explicitly. So this is just showing you, you know, if you restrict your search space, there are many complexes with symmetry, which have group-like symmetries, or even icosahedral symmetries. These occur in nature in viruses. And so, even the, um, you know, solution of reduced search space is now that I, once I fix a transformation, I'm going to just use and search from the generation of the symmetry group all the other copies. They have to be consistent, so I don't have to check for what combinations go where. So in the earlier puzzle, you know, A goes next to B, but in what orientation, and B can go next to C. And so the combinatorics of the O, what goes next to whom, is, is what makes the search space so exponentially large. With symmetry, we know exactly who the neighbors are going to be based on the neighborhood. So with low discrepancy sampling as well as the sampling based on the symmetry group, one can, can come up with a pretty uh, rigorous answer. But there's one little other twist. And how do you get something where you can go back and build these puzzles, where these complexes come up and form a certain fragment, but how do they close up and build a complete spherical shell, like what happens with 
virus capsid. So these are examples of known virus capsid with 240 copies, this is 60 copies, and this is 120 copies. And given time, I can't go into this into the detail, but it brings you into this nice theory of tiling theory, which is so well developed as well, and also the links of group theory and, and lattices. And so the good news is that you suddenly find, starting with a problem, you know, you suddenly you cannot learn all of mathematics. But every time you hit a problem where you have to go back and learn a little section of math, and you can pull that back into giving you an efficient or a accurate solution, then that's a great way of learning, I feel. And I enjoy that in my uh, uh, you know, research exercises that I like to do. So this got me into learning about two things. One is something called periodic tiling. Periodic tilings are all tilings generated by regular polytopes. And they are five platonic solids. And why are they only five in three dimensions and so on? And it's actually very easy to show that this is the only integer solutions of p minus two, p minus two equal to four, where p are the p-sided gons. So two regular gons can come together. Hence, in the plane, for example, pentamers can't fit together to form because the internal angle of a pentamer Pentagon is such that it will not form an integral multiple of 360. And so, but there's also this nice world of aperiodic tilings that people had observed that you could take, you know, edge to edge tilings which have more than one type of semi regular tiling uh, and also form two aperiodic tilings which are not invariant under translation, um, but they have some kind of local symmetries about them. And you can do them with more than one tile. Periodic tiles are all done with a single tile. These are all triangle tiles. These are all pentagons. These are all triangles. So the two upshots are there are five platonic solids. And if you think of them as all, you know, uh, the circumscribing sphere for each one of them, they will give you a tiling on the sphere. And if you took the 13 Archimedean solid and induce the tiling on the sphere, they give you a layout. They give you like a blueprint on which you can place proteins. So they discretize or tessellate the spherical space. And so what one can do is, and I'll skip this for now because of time, but you can go back and come up with the following algorithm. And I'll just lead you through this and, and close off from there. So you first take and generate all possible layouts of the sphere. So you can choose a tiling or a layout. And so you can enumerate the possible regular and semi-regular spherical tiling. So you have five platonic, 13 Archimedean. And so with this space, you can go back and start to have a finite space of, of spherical tiling. You also have to take certain subdivisions of the tiling so that you don't start off with just one, but you can subdivide them. And that's way you can not only predict a certain size, but you can also predict bigger and bigger size. Next, what you do is you look at the local symmetries induced by that spherical tiling. So for example, in an icosahedron, you have five-fold symmetries at the vertices, three folds in the triangles, and two folds on the edges. That is what I was explaining to you in the previous slide. So I didn't skip too much, but I, I know I'm going a little fast. But knowing the local symmetries induced by the polyhedral or the Archimedean solid, uh, the semi-regular tiling, you go back and first compute those configurations by your cyclic symmetric docking procedure. You call these local tiles C tiles or cyclic symmetry tiles. Next, you decorate your layout, the spherical layout that you have chosen by arranging these symmetric tiles in various corners and facets. These decorations, while they are locally consistent, might not be globally consistent. So you check for global consistency. So you build the C tile configurations, and they are flexible C tiles. So there are many possibilities of configuration. You have an uncertainty and a score for each one of them. You go back and arrange them. On, as a decoration on each one, 
you compute a global score and check for their intertile interfaces, and you optimize the one that kind of percolates to the top. So this algorithm does not require anything which is a combinatorial, you know, with the number of components that you have. It's basically how many tessellations of the sphere that you require. So the overall algorithm is polynomial in the in the number of components that are used, but constant in the I mean uh, uh, not exponential in the number of components. So this what is what gives us a polynomial time algorithm for searching, scoring, and ranking. And really, a lot of it is lifting the two-dimensional and the cyclic symmetric with the uncertainty quantification <coughs> put together. So, in our implementation, you know, what we are starting to do then is not only go back and predict various solutions, but we now have measures of uncertainty uh, as also as a measure of similarity. So, this was nature's solution. It's a model built from bioelectron microscopy um, of this viral capsid. And we can have multiple predictions, multiple rearrangements, which can actually produce something similar. And we can come up with a churn off bound on each one of them, meaning how close is this one to this one, how close is this one to this one. And you know, go back and see that they are, you know, nature has one kind of rearrangement of the capsid, which is how these things spontaneously self-assemble, but there are other alternative rearrangements with slightly different conformations, which perhaps might be a slightly higher energy or not energetically favorable, but in the whole, they might actually give you a complete proper tiling because they have under your global consistency score something which is pretty high. So similarly, here's two different versions of the same tiling. This is nature's model, but these are models that we can predict using our prediction. So if you wanted to design these nano shells, you could go back and come up and fabricate them or actually build architectural models if you want. They will glue together, they will have no gaps, and they'll have good affinity. But uh, having this predictive tool then allows you to do that. And then you can also see, you know, you can prove how close are they based on your model to the to some of the known solutions. It's like a stellation, but it's or something like that, yeah. Right. Yes. That's that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a great question, and I I agree with that. That kind of study can be done. Yes, yeah, possibly. But our goal here was to be comprehensive in the algorithm. We are searching for all predictions of all spherical assemblies, and hence what we are doing is. To make it comprehensive, I have to go back and enumerate each layout and each subdivision of them, and then search for them. True, true, true. So hence, finding out which ones are the layouts which will marry to solutions in nature is a good exercise, as well as a good question. Uh, but for the completeness of the algorithm, if I'm just saying, give it, here's a tile, tell me a shape which is spherical and closed and has good affinity amongst them and so on, tell me all the possible shapes you can get. So what I'm doing is I'm going to search through all of these layouts and decorate them. And I'm saying still the complexity is bounded. It's independent of the number of components because there's a finite number of such layouts and a finite number so, but your point is well taken in that some of these might not be feasible for viral capsids and for spontaneous assemblies, but all of them will give you different types of solutions. And hence, if you don't search for them, you might not discover certain assemblies that are also feasible. Furthermore, you know, by subdividing them, I can grow shells which are much larger than what occur in nature. Know, spontaneous assembly has a certain minimum size for the genome and so on. But if I wanted to build and say, 
if I give you three times the number of tiles, can you give me a shell which is complete with the same arrangement? And you can predict that size too, or say yes or no. So one can predict all the discrete sizes in this. So with that, I, and it's a good segue to taking questions. And there's more, but I'll stop here. And I haven't gone really over time, so we started 10 minutes Michigan time. So uh, I'll take questions and, and other comments. Thank you, Chandra. Any questions? Oh, first. Oh, worries. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start off. So your uncertainty yeah. quantification or your turn off bounds sounds like a really appealing way to compare different methods. And I wasn't clear if you had done that when you compared to the Nusinov Wilson approach and the other. So I did this for your... the docking, and I did this for uh, you know things like the GB calculation, which is based on the molecular surface and so on. But we haven't completed it for our assembly, uh, multi-protein assembly problem. Um, this is all part of Mohibur's thesis, so uh, um, so it's work still in progress. But we have a definitive way using these Magdiamet de deviations to go back and prove these bounds. Um, the other exercise I think that you're alluding to is how do we compare this method with others? We'll have to do the same analysis and see what is the best bounds we can do for UQ for those methods. That way we can see if their methods are better off with uncertainty propagation or ours. So that's another line of work to be done. Yeah. Yes. Mm. It's a very nice talk. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. So first of all, when you optimize your parameters, you use the training set use learning how do you over I mean avoid like over training over training right because right. this is a very often seen when, when we optimize our first field mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so the second uh, when you do use this uh, fast free or transformation for this uh, confirmation or change or docking what's uh, is that a similar or different from this uh, Kachowski's uh, fast free or transformation right uh, algorithm it is. OK, so there's two questions there. First is, whenever you're using machine learning approaches and you're using supervised learning, how do you make sure that you've got the right training set and you're not overtraining on your? And this is a, you know, a selection mechanism for what you're training with respect to. So what we were training with respect to was all of our various families of interactions between proteins, you know, antibody, antigen, enzyme, you know, uh, inhibitors and, and so on. So from the benchmarks that we had taken, we first separated how many of those complexes are grouped in each one. And what we did was we took a small fraction. Now, how did we choose that fraction? We tried to make it, you know, enough so that we could build not only positives from the benchmark, but also decoys. The decoys we generated you know, using perturbations. And uh, the, you know, the fact that we wanted to be careful that, uh, and the goal was that for each subfamily of interactions, we wanted to take a training set so that we can apply it to the predicting set that we were not really biasing the solution. But we were doing the following that we were applying different weights to different subgroups. Now, one other test we did um, was there was this, the newly released ZDoc4, which had lots of mixture of things. And so we went and did not take any complexes from that ZDoc4, but we trained with only ZDoc2 and 3, and then applied it to ZDoc4. To come back and unequivocally show that this is um, you know, the, the optimal solution is where one can go back and say, you know, um, are the weights that we are using optimal? Well, I don't know an answer to that. And that will then also be related to whether we, you know, kind of um, chose the right um, 
size of the training set plus also our procedure. Quadratic optimization is just one kind of case. So for the uses that I have, I'm, all I'm saying is I, I, was, uh, I was careful in choosing and not biasing my weights so that I would be over training them in some sense. But I had no definitive way of bounding them um, because I was not making any predictions of optimality of my training set. I was just saying I was just choosing them not by trial and error but by this learning method. Now, coming to your second question, which was related to um, the Kachalsky Kutzir method of old, they were doing that, you know, uh, FFTs. So there are two differences, and that's important. One is they were doing FFTs in translation space only and applying, for each rotation, you have to do a three-dimensional FFT. Uh, the fact that they were also doing uniform FFTs, so they were taking a uniform grid and then doing the FFT in that uniform grid. Our approach is using what's called non-uniform fast Fourier transforms or irregular fast Fourier transforms because we, and also the other reason is we are doing this over rotational space. So it's called polar FFTs. And sampling uniformly in polar FFTs is not feasible. So hence, we are doing low discrepancy sampling. Hence, we have to use also a non-uniform FFT. So coupling those two things together, we get both the speed up as well as some bounded calculations in our Fourier transform. So those are the main differences between our method and but great, thanks for the question. Other comments? It just seems like the gold mine would be in the micros that you can put the dodecahedron kind of in and drive them in that because that's where most of the. No, no, no. So the icosahedron and dodecahedron are dual. So that's you right. can use one or the other. Right. So you don't need to both. Yeah. But then so is like the octahedron and the cube. So you can, you don't have to use. Separate one. No, no, you can predict shell assemblies which are perhaps not obtainable in nature. Oh, yeah. And so, and then you can evaluate them for the strength of materials for nano shells. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so, hence, this is a yeah. generic rule. Yeah, so I'm, yeah, so I was just showing you the viral capsules just because we have good models and people who have actually you know, elucidated their structure from cryo EM and so on. So they were good testing cases. But having gone back and built a general procedure for spherical assemblies, one can build other kinds of capsules. And so there's another extension, of course, is to non look at non-spherical. And that's another way of you know, generalizing. So maybe I can ask, so you had your normal mode, kind of decomposition of the flexibility. Does that really contribute when you get to these higher order structures? Yeah, so they give you, so the, in these, in some sense it's increasing the space of what kind of arrangements you have. And so when you're testing them out of how close can you get to, in an RMSD sense also, to a model for a viral capsid. Just flexibility does make an improvement because small changes in the local rearrangements do occur. And if you are if you're going to just take rigid tiles or very low dimension, then you will not be getting very close RMSDs to the predicted solution. Or are there some of these configurations you can't get if you don't include that flexibility? We haven't tested that out as sophisticatedly as we should. What we did do for when we were doing pairwise dockings, we did a lot. I'll tell you how. So you go back and you, when you choose a model, a reduced model of, you know, uh, flexibility for a single protein or for each pair protein-protein interactions in like in our F3 doc, then we first went and calibrated them with respect to any other known structures of that protein independently in their APO forms. Uh, in crystal, in, you know, or maybe in complexes with other structures. So we have A and B, C, D structures available. Or we also did this with, you know, when we're running ITASR, when we generate different conformations. Then what we want to go back and see, can you 
start from one and reach the other and minimize the RMSDs when you say reach the other. So if your flexibility model is not large enough or not flexible enough, then you will not be able to come very close to the other structures. So that's a way of calibrating how good is the reduced space. Now coming up with a minimum reduced space given a structure is a, is a nice problem and yet, you know, I don't have a provable answer to that. But that's the kind of thing we have to do. For it. But it's a good question, you know, when you apply it to assemblies and we are trying to mimic some structures that people had given you, then one can see if we increase the flexibility space, then can we come closer to the true solution, which would be another nice thing. In cases where you have uh, multiple very close solutions, you can sort of think of those as uh, perhaps being you know, multiple local minima in some large non-convex space. Is there anything in nature, you sort of say, well, you've got two candidates for nature's solution. Is there, is there any phenomenon like these could possibly be correct and incorrect foldings in the sense that, you know, when you look at a suboptimal solution, right. it might be at the, um, uh, on the lip, the boundary right. between the two troughs in the energy landscape. And yeah, that could be, it could be, but I, um, you know, what I didn't mention in the details uh, of when we do the pairwise dockings, we cluster our solutions. So what we do is, you know, even though you're doing bounded load discrepancy sampling, there's so many little tiny variations mm -hmm. that are clustering around the same score, right. the same low minimum energy. We just picked one of the clusters. So we do distance-based clustering of the solutions in our predictions. So when we are reporting K edges for each pair, those K edges are pretty distinctive. So there's a cluster distance between them. So we don't take too many of the same. But, you know, um, one way of testing this hypothesis would be maybe take not just one from each cluster, but take maybe two or three from each cluster and then put it into the engine for the assembly and see if you suddenly get something right on the cusp where you get for one set of configurations and the choices of the spanning tree, you'll get something which is nice and stable. But for the other one, it says no, because the local configurations that you've chosen doesn't add up properly because there's a ripple effect. So that could occur, but I haven't checked that. And that's because, you know, nowadays we take each independent pairwise transformation and it's set to be, you know, one unique candidate from each cluster of the transformation space samples. But does the actual, um, I don't know how much, you know, time series you have on stuff like this, because it would probably be a very small scale, but, uh, you know, in nature that, cap is somehow going to form, it's not going to somehow all come together at one time, so there has to be some, you know, you're, oh, you're in some abstract geometric space or geometric possibility yeah, space. Yeah, yeah, so I'm yeah. not, I'm not uh, mirroring the assembly process. process, and so I'm not looking at the kinetics of assembly either. I'm solving this not also in a dynamical system setting, I'm doing this as an optimization problem, so I'm saying, here is the whole space, and I'm going to naively search, but I can search very fast using fast Fourier transform, and I try to give you where the hotspots of minima are, other than iteratively go from one to the next to the next to the next. So another way would be, you know, I first build up pairwise, and then triples, and then quadruples, and then see how these things aggregate and cluster to make up the whole. That would be kind of doing it in a dan you know, doing forward dynamics and mirroring somewhat the kinetics. Uh, but optimization cuts right through that, <laughs> saying, right. find me the minimum solutions, and because it's non-convex, find me the best ones. And so what we're saying is, well, sample, and then quickly score and pick up the best. Because if you don't sample well enough, you can't have any bounds on how good your score is. So that's the approach we've taken. But 
those are good you know, uh, approaches to consider if you're also trying to predict the assembly pathways. Uh, and, you know, validating or quantifying that could be if people have taken snapshots of, you know, uh, and once they can, um, maybe microscopy will get to that level or even tomography because, uh, um, yeah, electron tomography, because that way they can see the maturation process of virus capsid assemblies happening in the cell and see them at different snapshots. And then looking at the configurations, which are predominant, saying, okay, well, they all form pentamers and they all form hexamers, and then these hexamers and pentamers come together and then they expand out or something like that. So that would be a way of predicting the pathway. And I'm not doing that right. Thank you very much for your attention.